So welcome back. Um, last time we started really digging into Shakespeare's dialogue with the Psalms, and we focused on famous speeches by Hamlet and Portia. And next week, we're going to be um, welcoming our first uh, guest speaker after Professor Alter, and that is Hannibal Hamlin. And he is the author of several books on Shakespeare and scripture. So he's really the expert on our topic in my view. And today I'm going to be drawing on Professor Hamlin's reading of Psalm 137. So shout out to you, Hannibal. I'm calling The Tempest Shakespeare's Psalter because I think this is the play where Shakespeare draws most creatively, not necessarily the most heavily, but the most inventively on themes, images, and attitudes from the Psalms. And this includes references to actual Psalms, but I think more is going on here. I think the way that Shakespeare creates his world is fundamentally poetic in this play in particular, in the same way that the Psalms are fundamentally poetic. So we saw last time how Psalm 8 retells the story of creation in Genesis by briefly scanning, right, from the heavens down to the human being, down to the animals. So it's a kind of a trailer or montage that encapsulates and images what is a much more extended narrative in the Bible. And the historical Psalms, such as Psalm 114, uh, that recounts Exodus and other milestones in the history of Israel, take a similarly cinematic approach, giving us brief references to events such as the parting of the Red Sea or the wandering in the desert or the destruction of Jerusalem in order to convey the sweep of history in just a few really dense lines. And this is actually a very short Psalm that does a lot of history. Can we have a reader of Psalm 114? Uh, Kirk volunteered to read, Julian. Great. Thank you, Kirk. Psalm 114, in exitu Israel. When Israel came out of Egypt and the house of Jacob from among the strange people, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw that and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like young sheep. What aileth thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? And thou, Jordan, that thou wast driven back. Ye mountains that ye skipped like rams, and ye little hills like young sheep. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the hard rock into a standing water and the flint stone into a springing well. Thank you, Kirk. So you get kind of the, the story of the Exodus condensed here into just a few lines. And it has this very cinematic kind of flashback quality as we get these images of place and phenomenon, but not at all the full narrative. And that's a, a poetic principle that is very characteristic of the book of Psalms. Uh, Dante loved this psalm uh, so much that the souls arriving in purgatory are reciting it in the second great segment of the Divine Comedy. And we actually have a Dante scholar here, Margaret Rose uh, from UC Santa Cruz, who has agreed to read this. Would you like to read this in the Italian? And people can kind of read along in the English. In exitu Israel de Egipto, cantavan tutti insieme ad una voce, con quanto di quel salmo e poscia scripto. Beautiful, thank you so much. <laughs> so for Dante, um, this psalm really becomes an allegory of the soul as it leaves, as it leaves, I guess, the Egypt of this world for the next phase of its purgatorial journey. It's quite wonderful. Um, so the Tempest also participates in a kind of psalmic notation of both creation, like Psalm 8, and biblical history, like Psalm 114. The island, right, this is the great shipwreck play, for those of you who haven't read it recently. <laughs> the desert island is an Eden space, um, but it's also a place of wandering in exile, like the book of Exodus, and 
is a world that has just emerged from a flood, like the book of Genesis. And the Tempest doesn't retell those stories so much as call their landscapes to mind imagistically. So let's see how that works in the play. And I'm going to start by talking about bad, really bad weather in the Psalms. <laughs> and then I will look at a song by Ariel, the airy spirit of Prospero, and then a song by Caliban, the earthy spirit of Prospero, or of the island, I should say. Um, they belong to the island more than to Prospero. So in the Psalms, there are really a lot of references to storms and tempests, which are signs of God's strength and fury. But there are actually very few references to ships. The Israelites, unlike the English, were not a seafaring people. And so ships don't show up all that much in Hebrew scripture. One exception, however, is Psalm 107, a poem of thanksgiving that celebrates God as a redeemer from catastrophe, including, and this is Calvin's paraphrase, shipwrecks, famines, banishments, diseases, and disasters and war. So let's uh, look at the shipwreck passages. This is Psalm 107 uh, from Miles Coverdale's translation for the Book of Common Prayer. And we need a reader, Sean. They that go down to the sea in ships and occupy their business in great waters, these men see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For at his word, the stormy sea ariseth, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They are carried up to the heaven and down again to the deep. Their soul melteth away because of the trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. So when they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, he delivereth them out of their distress, for he maketh the storm to cease, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they are at rest. And so he bringeth them unto the haven where they would be. <laughs> wow. Thank you. That was really wonderful. So I'm, I'm really struck by the drama of this psalm. It's naturalism. It may be one of the most naturalistic of all of the psalms. We really feel that we are on a ship that is being tossed high and dragged low by the high waves. And we feel ourselves staggering like drunkards trying to retain our balance on this careening vessel. And we feel the power of the storm, but also the relief that comes when it passes. This is a nice paraphrase uh, by the rab medieval rabbinic commentator, David Kinchi. I wonder whether Barbara Grindel from one of my synagogue groups would be willing to read this. Uh, you never know when your name might be called, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the men of the ship go up to heaven rise high in the air when the wave lift, lifteth up the ship. And afterwards, because of the wave, they descend to the deep. And from thus ascending and descending, the soul of the men of the ship melteth within them on account of the danger in which they are placed. Thank you, that's beautiful. We also get a sense of the sea as a place of wonders and strange sights, right? These men, see the works of the Lord. I'll go back to this. They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Um, the works of the Lord are probably the storm and its quieting, which is like the tempest raised by Prospero at the beginning of Shakespeare's play. While the wonders of the deep tap the mysteries of the sea, right? It's birds and beasts, it's playful Leviathan, it's pearls, shells, and coral. So some themes of Psalm 107 that I think are directly relevant to the tempest include the limits of human authority in the face of God's power, the posture of supplication and the hope for deliverance, and then those wonders of the sea, which make the, the landscape of the tempest so sparkling. An evangelical sailor named Daniel Bell wrote an entire 
hundred page paraphrase of those eight lines from Psalm 107, which he wanted sailors to take with them to sea for their edification. And he details the terrors of tempests as well as the dangers of drunkenness. And he also provides a field guide to the wonders of the sea, including fish, birds, whales, and mermaids. So the tempest, I think, turns to Psalm 107 for its astonishing choreography of a ship at sea at the hands of a godlike magician who conjures storms and stills them. Okay, so um, some connections here that I would like to make between the opening of uh, The Tempest and Psalm 107 include the kind of staggering drunken rhythm as the sailors attempt to ride the waves. This was really beautifully captured in Eli's uh, directing of this play in, was it 2018, perhaps? Um, where the actors really made our little theater into a kind of capsizing ship through their bodily movements and their rolling back and forth along the floor of the stage. It was quite, quite extraordinary. And the play will later feature uh, two drunkard sailors, Trinculo and Stefano, as if materializing that line about we are like drunkards. The psalm and the play both use the movement of waves, vessels, and human bodies to make precarity and providence real and tangible for their audiences. We also have the wisdom of the bosun. He says, what cares these roarers for the name of king? Uh, there's a stress on the limits of human authority and a sense of humility and even reverence before the power of the elements. And we also get uh, the mariners with their supplication, right? All lost to prayers, to prayers all lost. We might compare this to Psalm 144, deliver me and take me out of the great waters, where the great waters uh, really are not the sea itself, so much as a metaphor of drowning that, that are, is overwhelming the psalmist at that point in their consciousness. Uh, and I was interested in the Timor clip, how she actually shows the sailors, uh, the passengers praying um, under, underneath the main, you know, in the cabin beneath, uh, they're supplicating to the Lord very much in the mode of the Psalms. Uh, storms appear throughout the book of Psalms as attributes of God's terrible majesty. And indeed, biblical scholars sometimes refer to the God of the Psalms as a storm God borrowed from neighboring religions. So this is Psalm 18. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion around about him with dark water and thick clouds to cover him. And there's a very similar line in one of Shakespeare's sources. This, uh, the Tempest is inspired by an actual shipwreck off the coast of the Bermudas in 1608. And William Strachey in his true repertory says, like a garment or a vast cloud, the storm filled her brim full for a while within from the hatches up to the spar deck. And so you see that image of the cloud as a garment. And so Prospero with his robe, and you saw Helen Mirren there with her incredible robe at the edge of the cliff as the camera panned back to her. Um, Prospero with his robe and his magical tempest seems to aspire to this divinity. And he must learn humanity as the play progresses. I'm not gonna talk much about Prospero, but I know Sean has a lot of great things to say about Prospero. Other Psalms emphasize the music of the ocean, which joins together with the rest of creation to praise the creator. This is the very symphonic Psalm 96. Remember that these Psalms were were designed for singing and also for instrumentation. And so I want you to imagine this as a, not just a metaphoric, but a real symphony. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea make a noise and all that therein is. So what we see in these Psalms is respect for the immense power of the sea, which is associated with God as creator of heaven and earth 
but also with the stories of flood and of exodus, the God of history, as well as the God of creation. In these watery Psalms, there's fear and anxiety, even despair, but there's also wonder at the majesty of God's work and the immensity of God's power. And at times, the seas make music that the psalmist accesses through the receptivity of their soul and the focusing instrument of poetry itself, moving beyond anxiety into wonder. And Miranda, the daughter of Prospero, who you also saw in that clip with her little sandcastle in her palms, Miranda's name means wonder. Although the sea is overwhelming, the Psalms are also delivered in the spirit of trust and thanksgiving. So I think the Tempest is Shakespeare's Psalter because he explores the narrative situation of storm and shipwreck in a framework of cosmic power and the hope of redemption. And he does so in a poetic key. Now I'd like to consider more carefully the role that music and song play in this landscape of climate extremes that are also emotional intensities and I think meditative exercises. Uh, Ariel song is one of the most famous lyrics in Shakespeare. Ariel is an airy spirit who serves Prospero but belongs, lives, inhabits, dwells in the island. And invisible, he sings the song to the young Prince Ferdinand, who has survived the shipwreck, but at this point believes that his father and the rest of the passengers of the ship are dead. Where should this music be? In the air or the earth? It sounds no more. And sure, it waits upon some god of the island, sitting on a bank, weeping again the king my father's wreck. This music crept by me upon the waters, allaying both their fury and my passion with its sweet air. Thence I've followed it, or it hath drawn me rather. But tis gone. No, it begins again. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. So Ariel's music, like David's lyre and the madness of King Saul, an episode which is sometimes taken as the kind of origin story for the Psalms as a genre, Ariel's music has the power to calm the passions. And Ferdinand, weeping by the water, he sounds a lot like the singers of Psalm 137, which I imagine is familiar to most and has been set to music many, many times. <laughs> by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. So Hannibal Hamlin, who is our speaker next week, he notes that the song of exile was the most widely read, quoted, translated, and paraphrased of all the Psalms. The exiled speakers, this is a narrative from the Babylonian captivity, the exiled speakers of Psalm 137 hang up their harps, right? They cannot or will not sing in such a state of abandonment and alienation. Yet a poem about the impossibility of song has nonetheless issued into this psalm and into many, many musical compositions. The illustration here is from a Franciscan antiphonal from the 14th century. You can see the musical notation at the bottom of the beautiful illustrated rubric or initial. Um, so we say that we're going to be silent and yet we have music. The poem seems to perhaps well up from the harmonic correspondences between the willows and the weepers, between the tears and the waters. Maybe the music even flows from the hanging harps themselves. The rabbis taught that David composed another psalm, Psalm 67, which is also called the Menorah Psalm, that he composed that psalm by transcribing the sounds made by the wind blowing his lyre in the night, a version of what is called the Aeolian harp or kind of natural harp of Greek musical theater. <laughs> 
So in this exilic space between silence and nonsense, a psalm is born. Okay, <clears throat> so there's the poem song that Ariel sings. And there's a couple of things I'd like to note there. Ariel's song is really sounding the wonders of the sea, right? Which we saw in Psalm 107. The sea is a place where, where precious treasure is stored and where the terror of drowning can be transfigured into something abiding. Um, you might compare this to Psalm 33, where God gathereth the waters of the sea together as it were upon a heap and layeth up the deep as in a treasure house. In Psalm 33, God's creative process is organizing the primal chaos, which is an unbounded sea of forces and energies, into something beautiful and bearable, something rich and strange. Robert Alter notes that in Psalm 33, the psalmist is combining motifs from creation, the separation of the sea from the land, with motifs from Exodus, the parting of the Red Sea. And this doubling of creation and Exodus really echoes Ferdinand's own situation. He is finding himself in both garden and desert, both Eden and Egypt. Ariel's song is a psalmic composition sung to the despairing Ferdinand, recovering art and solace within the churn of chaos. The song's vibrating aerial musicality is generated by the resonances between mood and setting, like harps hung on willows along the river of Babylon. So what about Caliban? Uh, whereas Ariel and Prospero cooperate with each other, Caliban has been enslaved by Prospero after apparently trying to have his way with Prospero's daughter, Miranda. And Caliban uses the language of the creator and the creature to describe the first phase of their relationship. So for example, you see in this passage um, that Prospero and Miranda have taught him how to name the bigger light and how the less. And this is a kind of a notation of the book of Genesis, the creation of the sun and the moon. And um, let's see, I think, yes, we have from uh, Psalm 136, give thanks unto the God of all gods who hath made great lights, where that word light is made to stand in for the different heavenly bodies. It's also a kind of a, a simplification rather than having specific names for these heavenly bodies. And Caliban's language lesson, I think it echoes a kind of translation process in which we see monotheism gradually building itself out of the images of natural or pagan religion. And that translation process actually resembles the composition of the Psalms themselves which are, and this is, here I'm quoting Robert Alter, are often monotheistic adaptations of polytheistic imagery. So we see that kind of in process in Caliban's speech. He also refers to the fresh springs, uh, which may be a reference to Psalm 87. Now, when the play begins, Caliban has fallen from Prospero's grace and has become a monster like the speaker in Psalm 71, I have become, as it were, a monster to many. And his persecution by Prospero sounds like Psalm 88. Thine indignation lieth hard upon me, and thou hast vexed me with all thy storms. It's interesting that Ariel refers to the still vexed Bermudas. We could say that Caliban is the vexed Bermudas. Uh, the kind of spirit of place who is tormented by the angry Prospero. Caliban gets to compose his own psalm towards the end of the play. Ariel has been leading the drunken sailors, Trinculo and Stefano, astray with strange music, and they're really freaked out. But Caliban hears something different in the music of the island. And I wonder whether Paul would be willing to read for us one more time. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. 
Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears. And sometimes voices that if I had, if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming, the clouds methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me that when I waked, I cried to dream again. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I should note that Paul is a trained professional actor with a very impressive, um, I don't think you say scenography, dra dramatography, <laughs> something like that. Um, so this image of a fructifying rain, we actually saw this last time in the context of Portia's mercy speech. And the fructifying rain really runs through the Psalms as a counter melody to the theme of storms. For example, Psalm 72, he shall come down like the rain upon the mown grass and as the showers that water the earth. And the thousand twangling instruments, this really recalls those harps hung up on branches in Psalm 137. Caliban is able to resolve the twangle and tangle of strings into music, into a new song, as David does in that menorah psalm, Psalm 67. So in Caliban's reverie, reason, imagination, memory, perception, and emotion, they resonate with each other like so many strings on the lute of the soul, as in Psalm 108. Oh God, my heart is ready. My heart is ready. I will sing and give praise with the best member that I have. Awake thou lute and harp. I myself will awake right early. Awaking the heart as an instrument and then the physical instruments joining in with the human song, quite extraordinary. So Sound and Sweet Airs is Caliban's Psalm 137, in which the harp sung by captives in despair yield a new willow song that gives shape and shelter to the creature's longing. So just to pull all of this together and then open it up for your comments and questions. In my reading, Prospero is the angry storm god who must learn to sound his own merciful capacities. Ariel and Caliban are the play's psalmists in search of a better God than the one who floods their island with the violence of his resentments. Ariel and Caliban play the great texts of creation and history of birth and exile as a musical score. We could say that they dwell poetically in scripture's landscapes of emergent form in the wake of parting seas, receding floodwaters, and the most gentle rain. Why didn't Shakespeare quote from the Psalms directly? Did other early modern playwrights do so? Well, Shakespeare does often quote from the Psalms directly. I think like Fresh Springs in this play is probably a reference, direct reference to the Psalms. And there are other direct references, tiny phrases uh, in the Tempest that have been linked to different versions of the Psalms. But they're not always the most interesting Psalms to bring into conjunction with the poetic world building of the play itself. Um, and so I think if we look at something like Psalm 107 and Psalm 137, um, they provide larger kind of compositional frameworks for thinking about how Shakespeare is thinking psalmically and composing psalmically in this drama. Uh, but there are, one could say countless phrases from Shakespeare, countless because it's very hard to count them because you're making a claim about, you know, what and how something is being quoted from what version and so forth. Um, but what I'm interested in, I think this is also true, Sean, with your work on the sonnets, is something beyond those very specific citations and something that has more to do with the, the compositional process. I'll just add, <clears throat> you'll hear me say this again in a few weeks, that um, one of the first texts that uh, boys in the grammar school in Shakespeare's era were asked to translate into Latin was the Psalter. Uh, 
because it was readily available in English, right? So it's the it's the proving ground for their knowledge of Latin grammar and vocabulary at the very beginning. The outcome of that curriculum in general, the Latin only curriculum of the Elizabethan grammar school is imitation, not citation. That is, you're meant to dissolve the boundaries between your own language and the language of your source text uh, so that they become sort of one and the same, right? So I think, you know, uh, it, it may be true that the Psalms is the biblical text that Shakespeare seems to draw upon the most across all of his works. I think Julia and I have figured that out by looking into this. But he only mentions the psalmist once in the whole the whole assortment of uh, uh, illusions, and that's in the second part of Henry the Fourth. Justice Shallow says to Falstaff, "As the psalmist saith, we're all doomed to die." Right. So, um, so he, he the, when you go looking for the psalms in Shakespeare, I think you have to, uh, you know, accept as a starting point that you are entering an atmosphere or trying to say something about a mood that is um, related to the Psalms rather than looking for sort of uh, footnotes to the Psalms. Wouldn't you agree, Julia? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, no and yeah, we can look at some of this. Excuse me, is that Paul? No, it, no that was Kurt. It's me again. There, there oh, was hi, no Kurt. explicit prohibition against oh. biblical quotations at the time. No. Um, no, there were rules about saying God's name on stage. Yeah. And so you often will get Jupiter and rarely Jehovah or God. Well, I don't know about God, but you, you know, you, there were, there were prohibitions and they came and went. So there's a lot of date dating issues having to do with that as well. You can't swear on stage and how swearing is defined is complex, I, I um, but you certainly can quote the Bible. I, I think that your question is really interesting, Kirk, in the sense that, you know, when a character in Shakespeare invokes, say, a classical author by name, my impression is that a character is almost always trying to assert his or her authority at a moment when the reading of that classical author is in dispute. So, you know, Titus Andronicus is a notorious case in which characters are constantly referring to Virgil and Ovid by name and what, or their texts by name and what they're doing is arguing with each other about who has authority to interpret that text at that moment. But for, for whatever reason, Shakespeare isn't uh, interested in making disputes about the meaning of biblical texts so, as explicit as that. And maybe that does come closer to uh, the spirit of your question, which is that maybe he has a sense that, um, not that there's a prohibition on doing so, but that... Um, uh, that's a kind of uh, risk he isn't willing to take to stage a dispute about a biblical text. I don't know. That's it's interesting. I'll think about what you have brought forward, Paul. And you do we're, we're have you do have time. you do have characters arguing about scripture, for example, in Merchant of Venice, yes. where Antonio and Shylock have that argument about how to to um, interpret Jacob's thrift, um, right. but. Not, not, in the, certainly isn't that kind of, that's unusual. And you certainly don't see it in The Tempest. Paul Whitworth, was that your hand flailing around or were you just putting on your sweater? You are muted. You are, you're muted, Paul. No, neither. I was just waving goodbye to somebody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any thoughts now that you're unmuted since we know you've thought deeply about these texts uh i don't no, no no there are no thoughts that spring to mind at the moment okay <laughs> julia there's a, a question in the chat from caroline do you want to read that out sure <clears throat> Um, so Caroline, who's trained in rabbinics as well as Shakespeare, says um, the synthesis of Exodus with creation is resonant with Rashi's comment that there is not a before or after in the Torah. Are there other plays that seem to synthesize creation and the Exodus through the Psalms? Um, I think it's a great, beautiful, beautiful question worthy of its own session to answer that. Um, I think as you like it. It does something similar. I think that the forest and as you like it is both an Eden space and an Exodus space. There's very clear 
references to Exodus when the young girls are leaving the Dukes, uh, they're the Duke, the bad Dukes um, estate and go, uh, going into the forest. They, they resemble the Israelites taking gold from their Egyptian neighbors as they pack um, to go off into this next phase of their life's journey. And um, I haven't tracked it carefully with the Psalms in mind, <laughs> but um, I, you know, I think that the poem that Orlando, a kind of antiphonal poem, right? Antiphony is where there's two speakers and in a kind of cor chorus going back and forth. And quite a few of the Psalms were probably composed as antiphonal compositions for recitation at the Temple Mount with um, the Levitical choir being answered by the people, for example, or perhaps two Levitical choirs in conversation with each other. And there's that wonderful moment when Orlando and the Duke, uh, both of them sort of on their own Exodus journeys in this quasi-Edenic space, compose this hospitality poem together. And it's not literally antiphonal because one speaks and then the other does, but they repeat each other's words. And it has a very um, poetic and ritualistic and also a very prayer-like quality. It's about hospitality, but it's also about church bells and kind of the good old ways when, when people, you know, celebrated um, as they did before the Reformation. <laughs> and so that to me is a very psalmic moment. And I imagine that there's other psalmic moments. Well, I mean, the image of the deer that is thirsty um, is from someone who knows the Psalms by heart better than me. There's a famous deer, deer psalm. As the deer searches for the water brook, so do I, Lord, search for, I can't remember the rest of it. Sorry, I can, I'll find it. Thank you, it. Sean. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's certainly one of the backgrounds for Jay Quiz's famous speech about the deer who is kind of like the like the Israelites on the on the river Euphrates is sweep is weeping into that brook, you know, that Psalm 137 type, which Hannibal Hamlin sees all over the place in the 16th and 17th centuries. But that uh -huh. Jay Quiz speech, I think, could easily be read in relationship to um, the psalm that Sean just referred to. It's Psalm, 40, Psalm 42, like as the heart desireth the water brooks, so longeth my soul after thee, O oh my God. My soul is a thirst for God, yea, even for the living God. When shall I come to appear before the presence of God? And heart, H-A-R-T, is a deer. But of course, for the Renaissance writers, there was always also a, um, a pun on the heart, the, what would be the lev in Hebrew, the heart or the, the, the cordis, I guess, in Latin. Um, so a lot of complex, wonderful translinguistic things. Psalm going 42 on there. actually uses the heart heart pun. I think it was implicit in how Sean, in the translation that Sean just read. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's explicit in the next verse. But it's not in the Hebrew. Oh, so it's, oh. a, it's, a pun, it's a pun that um, res, or in the Latin, the Vulgate, or in the Septuagint. <coughs> so it's a it's a it's a pun that is born in the vernacular translation of the Psalms, yeah. and that itself is a little miracle. <laughs> um, Julia, do you have anything to say about Psalm sixty nine? I was just um, scanning Coverdale's edition. <laughs> for imagery of floods and whatnot. And I found in, uh, in 69, Coverdale has the psalmist saying, let not the water flood drown me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. So it's another, if you're going, right. to, develop, if you're going to develop this, it's another big um, flood and- Yeah, and I may even cite it in here, I don't remember. I used to have a lot more drowning images um this but is, yeah i mean uh, and this is something which alter is very good on yeah. uh, he really sees these images of drowning as one of the main image clusters in the book of psalms mm -hmm. and it relates to if you were here for alter's talk he talks about nefesh which is um, often translated as soul uh, mm -hmm. but he insists on returning nefesh 
as often as possible to its Hebrew meaning as neck. And so like I'm up to my neck in the waters or I'm being overwhelmed by the waters, my nefesh, my soul, my neck. Um, So that imagery is very powerful in the Psalms of complaint in particular. And I think is very relevant to the Tempest, but also to Pericles, which is probably even more psalmic than the Tempest, but because people don't know it as well. um, I didn't really want to go there as my my exemplary text. Um, But this drowning imagery is very powerful and is definitely part of this whole complex of imagery that interests Shakespeare and others in the period. And there's a question here about the Greek uh, Greek seafaring. Uh, yeah, I mean. Ariane is just taking uh, up that question in the chat. Ariane, do you want to? Say what yeah. you just wrote. Hi, Ari. Hi, Dr. Sure. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Lepton, Professor Lepton, Professor Pylon. Um, yeah, I think I, that's a that's a great question. And I think that certainly um for Shakespeare, those Greek seafaring narratives um which come down to us as romances. So they were these sort of prose adventure stories with characters running off in lots of different directions all over the Mediterranean world. Um, Those are definitely in the background of some of Shakespeare's source materials. Um, For the psalmists, I I think, and maybe Julia or Sean, you'll have a a more, a fuller answer to this. I think that those, um, that particular kind of, um, you know, like those Greek romances are are later, they're sort of first, second century. So I think they they post-date the Psalms by quite a bit. Um, Homer is probably closer I can't remember from our discussion last week when when we think the Psalms were composed. So whether where Homer was in relation to that. Um, But there are uh, but probably the the closest I I would presume that the closest sort of seafaring neighbors to the psalmists um, geographically as well as culturally were the Phoenicians. Right. And and what is well, yeah, my people (laughs) in in what is present day (laughs) Lebanon. that was a very uh, expansive seafaring culture. They also traveled all over the Mediterranean and and colonized many different parts of the Mediterranean, although with a different approach to it than the Greek speaking um, peoples had. So there, um, sadly, we don't have a lot of Phoenician literature, so we don't know that much about uh, what, you know whether any of that uh, you know if there were sea- seafaring tales or poems about shipwrecks and storms that uh, that came down they haven't survived, but it's certainly in the background of a, of a lot of, I mean, there's, and there's, you know, there are a lot of Phoenician references and influences in a number of biblical texts. I think. So. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to probably say, but with less authority than Ariane. Um, that, yeah, that my understanding is that the Israelites did not themselves sail much and that, but they did trade with the Phoenicians. And so this is probably a Phoenician, possibly a Phoenician influence as well as a Phoenician contact narrative. So that would be a really interesting thing to look at in more detail. I love that possibility. Um, the other intertext here or source would be the book of Jonah. And the book of Jonah <clears throat> definitely has, it has its own Psalm in it. Uh, Jonah gives a psalm of thanksgiving um, from within the the belly of the whale. And the whale, of course, is affiliated with the Leviathan in the ancient biblical texts. And um, the Jonah text definitely has some of that Greek and Phoenician travel narrative quality to it. Um, So the the book of Jonah and it's and Jonah is preaching to non-Jews. He goes to Nineveh. So Jonah is a very interesting figure in all of this um, for um, another kind of psalmic scriptural narrative uh, that is very much part of the Tempest. And Ariel's song, <clears throat> the preview for Ariel's song, I didn't get into this in my slideshow, <laughs> but the preview for Ariel's song is a beautiful passage from the play Pericles, which we are performing this summer at the New Swan. And Pericles gives this incredible funeral elegy for his wife, who he believes is dead at sea. 
and he's getting ready to put her her coffin with her body in it overboard, much as Jonah is thrown overboard in the book of Jonah by the sailors during the storm in that biblical text. And his palm that he gives, um, which is very priestly, very Levitical, if you will, um, the palm that he gives over her body is very clearly modeled on the palm, the psalm of thanksgiving in the book of Jonah. And then Pericles's palm is the model for what Ariel does in the Tempest. Um, so there is this lineage. It's not direct citation to come back to Kirk's opening question, but there's a very clear image and text lineage going from Jonah's psalm to Pericles' elegy to Ariel's song. And Jonah's psalm can be seen in the context of the Tehillim or the Book of Psalms. So there's just really great, fantastic material here. We're at 1256. And Sean and I always uh, stay for an extra 15 minutes for people who can't get enough of Shakespeare and the Psalms. Other people have lunch and classes and other interests. So we can take one more question from the larger group and then we'll stop the recording and continue on with anyone else who would like to study with us. Julia, Olivia Rawls just put something in the chat you might want to speak Olivia, to. Olivia, could you please ask us your question, Olivia? Hi, uh, yeah. Olivia well, is probably, one of our PhD students. We probably don't have time to have you say all the wonderful things I'm sure you can say about this, but I just love the kind of elemental um, nature of these psalms that you're pointing us to and how you're connecting it to the tempest and um, to all these ways we think of water as storm, but as as the fructifying rain, but also as quenching the thirst of the, the nefesh of the psalmist. Um, but then how you kind of position Caliban and Ariel as these two psalmists, but, but one, of course, as being the kind of airy spirit and Caliban is the earthy creature. And if you could just say more about kind of earth and air, I guess, in these psalms. Right, right. Well, um, the four elements are super important to this play. And they're also important to, you know, ancient physics. And I know Carolyn's done work on the Kabbalah and how the Kabbalah relates to Tempest is often seen as a Kabbalistic text and an alchemical text. So there's, um, there's rich structures, kind of allegorical, elemental structures and infrastructures, if you will, um, connecting a whole range of texts around the four elements. Um, this also comes up in Antony and Cleopatra, which some of you have studied with me, in which Cleopatra wills herself to become fire and air, the lighter elements rather than the heavier elements, which have dominated earlier in the play. Um, so there's a lot to be said about that. And I think that's a beautiful question, Olivia. So I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to, I want to thank everyone who's joined us for the full session. I'm going to stop the recording. Next week is Hannibal Hamlin. Uh, so please do come back for one of the world's leading experts and commentators on Shakespeare and the Bible, as well as the Psalms in particular. And uh, it's been really great sharing the hour with you. And we're thank going you, Julia, to- Thank you, Julia, for your talk. It was fantastic, as usual. Thank you, Sean, always.